We're going to start off tonight talking about <clears throat> Agile testing. Uh, now, I don't know how much experience you all have in Agile development and Agile testing. I imagine some of you probably a lot. Some of you may not have heard of it. A lot of you are probably, most, most of you probably in between. So traditionally, um, we've traditionally done testing by um, kind of adding it on at the end, right? And if you look at that uh, V diagram that I've been showing the last couple of weeks, if you actually follow the V diagram in order and are doing waterfall development, you do all your requirements, then all your architecture, then all your design, then all your implementation, and only after that do you start doing testing. Um, and we know that the later in the project life cycle you get, the more expensive it is to do testing. So we'd like to find and fix defects as early in the life cycle as we can. Now, in traditional testing, even in the waterfall model, right, there's the, there's the idea that, well, if we do a lot of requirements analysis, and if we do a lot of architectural analysis, and if we examine these things really carefully, we can try to avoid defects. And that is true up to a point. Right? We can do that through you know, a careful analysis of our design and of other things as we're doing it. However, there are a couple of assumptions there that are problematic. The biggest one is the assumption that the requirements that we produce are complete and are accurate and don't change over time. Uh, and in practice, that has been proven to basically just be false all the time. Uh, and largely for that reason, that's why that waterfall model of software development is broken. That would be a very effective way and a very efficient way to do software if we were always right in the beginning, but we're not actually very good at being right about our requirements. So how do we write good code, right? If we can't start everything at the beginning, um, how, we, how do we do good code? Um, and that's actually, you know, still really a major industry challenge. Um, and we've kind of gone from waterfall into agile that I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and there's still kind of a question mark at the end about, all right, what's my most reliable way to get to good code? So agile development, agile methods start by recognizing that engineers and customers and product managers and anyone else in the loop, uh, we're not really good at developing requirements, right? We often don't understand at the beginning what this product should really do. Um, we tend to not be able to anticipate the changes that we really are going to care about. And we often don't end up caring about the changes we do anticipate. And so requirements get out of date quickly. Um, requirements can change frequently, sometimes even continuously across the project. And of course, if your model is, I'm gonna do all my requirements and then all my architecture and then all my design and then start my implementation, and now my requirements have a change, right? We're forced to go back and redo requirements and redo architecture and redo design and then start redoing implementation. And then my requirements change again. And, and you can kind of see that it's very hard to make a lot of progress on a project that way. <clears throat> so in agile development, we instead look to start small with small parts of the system and evolve and grow those parts of the system over time as we go and as we learn. Um, so you can go out to agilemanifesto.org out on the web and you can find the original Agile Manifesto. This is probably the better part of 20 years old right now. Um, but, you know, still interesting, still a lot of value in it and it's something that, you know, industry as a whole, the software development industry as a whole is still really struggling to figure out how to best work with. Um, but the Agile Manifesto, the key points that the authors of that were making or that there are a lot of things out there, right? And in Waterfall, we were kind of bogged down with very specific processes and a very extensive documentation. I remember early in my career, we would actually do, um, we would actually write the code once in what we called PDL, Program Design Language, which was kind of a, a little bit of a higher abstract language, a lot like Pascal, if 
you know, anybody's old enough to have done Pascal. Uh, and we'd write it in this pseudocode, and then we'd go back and write it again in C or C++, well, C++ wasn't around then, but in C or in whatever we were implementing it in. And, you know, you kind of had to sit back and scratch your head and think, why did I write the code twice? What was, what was the point of that? Especially since as I wrote the actual code and fixed things, it diverged further and further from what the design, you know, what my pseudocode design was. And my pseudocode design ended up being a waste of time. So the authors of the Agile Manifesto basically are saying that there's a lot of things that are important, but comparing individuals and interactions between them to processes we care about individuals and their interactions more. And comparing working software to extensive documentation, we care about working software more. And with comparing customer collaboration, working with customers as compared to contractual negotiations and requirements and things like that, we care about the collaboration more. And compared, comparing responding to change versus following a plan, we care more about responding to change. So the things on the right aren't necessarily bad and aren't necessarily wrong, but according to the Agile Manifesto, those things on the left are more important. <clears throat> so Dilbert gets a chance to try Agile programming. No more documentation, just start writing code and complaining. All right, so when we're talking about agile development, we actually have to take a little bit of a different view of correctness. And traditionally, when we would have maybe been doing extensive upfront modeling and analysis of our system, we might put together some, uh, some idea of universal correctness, right? So for all possible values of X and Y, X and Y always have some relationship. Um, in agile development, we kind of reduce our emphasis on that, on, that, um, on that analysis, and we rely on our testing, right? We rely on our set of tests to prove that our system is correct. So instead of saying, uh, you know, by analysis for all possible cases, this is true, we'll say, well, I have a set of tests. And if all of these tests pass, or if all of these tests um, have the, show the desired behavior, then I believe my system to be correct. Now, it's possible I don't have enough tests. We'll certainly add tests over time. Some of my tests may be incorrect, right? So this is, this is imperfect, but at any time, I have a set of tests that can demonstrate that as far as I'm able to understand at this point, my system has the correct behaviors. Uh, and so we're using this kind of this existential view of testing as demonstrated by tests, rather than this universal view of correctness demonstrated by a lot of in-depth analysis. So agile methods and their testing work best when we can take those tests and run them against the current version of the software at any time, or even better, all the time. That helps us catch mistakes earlier, and it really helps us get the maximum amount of value out of our tests. I mentioned last week, I think, when we were talking about test automation, that it's tempting to think of test automation in terms of, well, I'm going to spend some time automating this test so that I can run it, you know, so that when I run the test, it'll be fast and reliable. And that's good. But the real value of an automated test isn't that running it once is fast. It's that I now have the ability to run it more than once. 10 times, 100 times, 10,000 times, right? Five times a day, every time someone checks software in, I can run it almost infinitely for very low additional cost, right? It's base, once I've done the work and I've written it, it's basically free. Yes, there's test maintenance and that's a significant thing, but I'm gonna maximize the value I get out of my tests by running them again and again and again. <clears throat> And my best way to maximize that value is to use what's called a continuous integration server. And this is something like Jenkins or Bamboo or Microsoft Team Foundation Server. And that tool will automatically rebuild the system and rerun all the tests to check the behavior anytime any update is checked into the system. Um, so we always have immediate feedback. Every time we make any small change to the system, we have immediate feedback about whether the system is still behaving the way we expected it to behave. 
And so the key point there is our continuous integration system, it's not merely running tests. The key point is that those tests are telling us that we still have a correct system. And using continuous integration reduces risk. So here in this red line, this red line would be representative of traditional development. So we start with all of our software checked in and known, and then we're all out there, the whole team is out there making changes, and we keep making changes and making changes and making changes until we're really, we have quite a lot of changes built up. And then we have this big periodic integration effort where it's basically, okay, everybody stop what you're doing. This week we're integrating all those changes and you've got all this work for all the different conflicting things that got changed along the way and a lot of work to get all of those changes integrated and working back to our baseline system. And then we do it all again and make lots and lots and lots of changes and then we have this big effort to get our system back to working again. Uh, so at any time, our system is relatively far away from a known working system. <clears throat> when we're using Agile development and a continuous integration tool, we're more like following the green line and we're making just a little bit of a change and then integrating that and running all the tests and verifying that our system is correct and then making a little bit of change and running our tests and verifying the system is correct. So we're never very far away from having a working fully tested system. <clears throat> so how do we in practice um, build these tests in, you know, how do we in practice build our software using an agile approach and build our tests to go with it. And one approach to that is test-driven development. And test-driven development is just a method for developing low-level tests. Typically, we're talking about unit tests. And we're developing those unit tests as we develop the software. And in fact, although this at first sounds crazy, we're developing the unit tests before we implement the software. So we're going to write a test. We're going to derive a test from some feature based on a requirement or a user story or wherever we're getting our information from about what the system should do, what the software should do. And the first thing we're going to do is write a test that tests to see if the software does that. And of course it won't because I haven't written the software yet. And then we're going to write just enough software to make that test pass. And one of the core principles here is Yagni, you ain't going to need it, or you aren't going to need it if you prefer better English. Um, we're trying to only build software that is strictly necessary to fulfill the requirements. And we're trying very hard to avoid um, what's often called gold plating or extra features, right? Things that, oh, hey, it would be nice if it did this too. Well, did you have a requirement to do that? Well, no, not really, but you know, it seemed like it would be nice. That takes up a lot of time, it takes up a lot of effort, and it bloats the software size. <clears throat> and the important part of an increase in software size is that the bigger the software gets, the more defects it has in it. So one of the best ways we can use, one of the best methods we can use to control the number of software defects is to control the overall software size. So here's a, uh, a flowchart of how test-driven development works. So we'll start up here and we'll identify a feature and then we're gonna implement the unit test for that feature. Now, of course, we don't have an implementation in the code yet. We were actually written the test first and then we're gonna run the test and we would like to see that the test fails and the test should fail because we haven't written any implementation for that capability yet. What if the test doesn't fail? What if it passes? Well, that probably means that I have some serious error in the test and the test isn't behaving the way that I thought it should be behaving. Um, and so that's why we actually run the test first, just as a little bit of a sanity check. Let's make sure this test fails. Then we'll implement some code and retest and continue to implement code until we get the test to pass. Once we've gotten the test to pass, we'll come over here to the right side and we'll refactor the code. I'm gonna talk about refactoring on the next slide. So just for the, for the moment, let's just take that uh, We'll, we'll just set that aside. We'll refactor the code. We're gonna make sure the code still passes once I've refactored it. Then we're going to consider, okay, do I have enough tests for this? And this is a place where we can apply test criteria. 
to say, all right, I wrote some code, I wrote, I wrote some tests, I wrote some code. Is that code really tested enough? Let me think about that. And if it's not, then I should go back and write some more tests and go through this process um, until everything passes and I feel that I have enough tests and then I'm done and I can go on and pick my next feature or my next requirement or my next use case or my next whatever it is we're writing software based on and start the process all over again. So I talked about refactoring. What is that? So refactoring is simply, uh, there are a lot of definitions out there. I like this particular one. It's simply changing the internal implementation of the software without changing the external behavior. So the interface remains the same. Uh, the behavior as viewed from the outside remains the same, but I'm changing the internal implementation. Why would I do that? Um, well, I might do it because I very purposely took a quick and dirty approach to writing that code the first time around, right? I was trying to be fast. I was trying to do a simple implementation. And now I may look at that and go, hmm, this code's kind of ugly. It's not very maintainable. There are bits and pieces that are copied around. Let me pull those copies out and put them in a, you know, and put them in a private method. Um, let me clean this up and reformat it. And, oh, you know, it would be better if I changed the algorithm, I could make it more efficient. So we're trying to improve our, our readability, our maintainability, our performance, things like that. Um, we're trying to reduce code smells. Uh, code smell is an agile term that basically is just like, it, it refers to parts of the code that are ugly, right? You know, things that you look at and you go, hmm, that's really not a very nice, elegant piece of code. Um, we're also using it to reduce technical debt. And technical debt is simply the concept of, hey, I took a shortcut here. This is something we might regret later. Right? Anything I might regret later, that's technical debt. And now refactoring is my opportunity to reduce that technical debt by making a cleanup of the software. And if I have a good set of unit tests, I can refactor, um, I can refactor fearlessly, right? I don't have to be too worried about refactoring because when I refactor, I will run all the tests again. And if all my tests pass, then I'm really pretty comfortable that I didn't break anything because I had a good set of tests. If I didn't have a good set of tests, I would be pretty worried, or at least I ought to be pretty worried um, about going in and making a lot of changes to my software because am I accidentally going to break something? I mean, that's pretty easy to do. But as long as I've got a good set of tests, I'm protected from that. Uh, professor, small question. Yes. Uh, in the previous slide, uh, so when you consider refactoring, uh, does changing the logic of the code is also considered as refactoring? Yeah, I could be changing. Um, I could be changing the logic, although I'd, I'd prefer to say I'm changing the internal implementation. Right, I'm, I'm changing how the code was written, but I'm not changing what the code does. So yeah. the key, the key to refactoring is all of the tests that passed before I refactored should still pass after I refactored. I didn't add any new capability. I didn't take any capability away. I just cleaned up what I had in there. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks for asking. All right, so you know, those of you who are, uh, you know, uh, out there working commercially, um, it's pretty rare these days to start a software project just from a clean sheet. Okay, well, we have no code. We're going to write some brand new thing. Um, that's pretty rare these days, right? Most projects now are an expansion or an enhancement of something else, or even if it's something new, there's pieces of it that you're going to reuse from previous projects, or maybe you're going to reuse some free and open source software. Um, and a lot of that code is what we call legacy. And legacy code is just, legacy just refers to code that um, it may not have up-to-date tests or it may not have any tests. It may have been written to requirements that are outdated or lost the design documentation. Maybe there was some, maybe there wasn't any, but we probably don't have it anymore or the code has changed so much 
that it doesn't really match the documentation. The documentation isn't very useful anymore. The only source of information about legacy code is the code itself. Uh, so I'm going to mention a couple of times a, a book that I've, I've got a reference to at the end. Um, the book by Michael Feathers called uh, Working with Legacy Code, I think it is. Um, his definition of legacy code is very simple. He says, legacy code is code that doesn't have tests. And it's as simple as that. Uh, and we often choose not to change that legacy code because, frankly, we don't really understand it. There aren't good tests. There's not good documentation. We're very worried we're going to break it. And it's hard to know if we've broken it or not. Um, now, we'd like to say, all right, I've got this million lines of legacy code. It's not really tested. We don't really understand it. Let's go write a bunch of tests. Um, but that could be, you know, that could be a year or more worth of work, right? And and no, no commercial program, right? That you just can't do that. There's there's no time to do that. There's no money to do that. You're not going to go back, and just rework all this legacy code. <clears throat> so we can't go back and rewrite tests, but we're kind of stuck with this code, and we can't just give up, right? So so what can we really do? How can we deal with this legacy code? And one of the better ways, yes. Hi, I, I wanted to mention that book, uh, Working Effectively with Legacy Code by Michael yeah, that's, Feathers. Yes, that's the title I was thinking of, thank you. Yeah, it's it's a really good book. Uh, it goes over techniques to, you know, put the put legacy code under tests and then modify it, and, and he, he's got like technique after technique of doing that, and it's it's definitely a, a good read if you work in Java on legacy code. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great book, and it's, um, I think it's probably 15 years old or so now. I mean, that book's been around for a while, and most technical books after, I don't know, two, three, five years tops, they're like, oh yeah, that, that's so outdated. Uh, and this book is 15 years old and still as useful as the day it was written. So we're actually going to cover a number of the topics. It's a big book, and this is a small lecture. We're going to touch on a number of the topics from the book. And so one of those is, uh, so incremental TDD, incremental test-driven development. This is a way that we can help deal, a way that can help us deal with that legacy code. So if we need to go into legacy code and we know we need to make a change, um, what might we do? Well, we could use test-driven development approaches to write tests just for that little piece that we're changing, right? We know that we don't have the time and don't have the budget to go back and write tests for some giant chunk of it. But this little piece that we're changing, we could at least write some tests for that. So in practice, I might first go in and write a few tests that check that, that just test the, that little piece of code as it is now. That gives me a baseline. Now I understand what the code does. Then following test-driven development practices, I'll change that code, uh, excuse me, I'll change those tests to expect the behavior that I want. And then I'll go change the legacy code to get that behavior. And then I have an opportunity to refactor the legacy code and maybe ch maybe clean it up. And again, I'm talking about just a little piece of it, but clean up that little piece of code. And so now I've got one little piece of my legacy code that has tests, that hopefully has comments, that's more understandable and more maintainable than it was before. And as the project as the project continues, we keep dipping back and finding things that we need to change in legacy code. We write a little test wrapper around it. So we have more and more little bubbles of tests right throughout our legacy code. And eventually, if the project went on forever, eventually we'd get tests throughout much of that legacy code area. So it's at least a reasonable way that we can try to make life a little better as we go. So there is one testing shortfall that we need to think about here though. When we're using test-driven development, uh, are we by nature writing tests that test the software thoroughly? Um, do those tests achieve good, th good coverage? Do they find most of the faults? And if the tests pass, how confident are we that the software is reliable? 
And the answer is, hmm, well, it actually depends. And, and maybe the tests that automatically come out of doing test-driven development may not automatically be that great because when we're writing those tests, we tend to focus on happy paths. And happy path is a term I'm gonna use a lot over the course of the semester. And really all I mean by that is some normal situation, right? Some normal expected use of the code. Um, and tests that focus on happy paths might miss things that users who don't understand the code well, right? When you're the developer, you know how the code should be used, or at least you know how you think the code should be used. And you will tend naturally to write tests that reflect the way you think the code should be used. Now you get some other user who comes along who has no idea what the implementation of the code is and doesn't care. They're just trying to get a job done. So they might click this and pull that. Oh, what happens if I do this? Um, that might put scenarios into the code that really weren't things that you were thinking about as a developer. And then, of course, we might have malicious users, right? Users who are actually trying to subvert the system. Um, and those are not the kinds of tests that we tend to write during test driven development. So how can we, def how can we design better tests? Uh, and going back to our test model that we, our, our model driven test design um, flow chart or path that we looked at in previous classes, we can take a human based approach or we can use modeling and criteria. Um, so when we take a human-based approach, we might actually create additional user stories that describe some of those unusual paths. Um, what happens when a user tries to withdraw more money from their account than is actually in there? What happens when someone tries to put in someone else's account? Uh, something like that. Um, that can be very effective, but it tends to be an intuitive process, right? It's, it's, it's not really... It's a hard thing to teach. There's not really a step-by-step -step process that you can go through to do that. Some people are really good at it. Um, I'm not really one of those people. <laughs> uh, so it's, and it's also hard to know when you're finished, right? When do I have enough use cases? When do I have enough exceptional paths? It's hard to know that. Um, or we can use modeling and criteria where we can model the input domain or model the software behavior using a couple of different um, techniques. And then we can apply a test criterion to it. That's a discrete process. It might be a lot of work, but it's a process that is explainable. We can turn the crank, we can work our way through it relatively mechanically. And it has a built-in notion of completeness. When we've covered all of the test requirements that our criterion that our criterion demanded, then we know we're done. And that is largely part two of the textbook and the rest of the semester starting next week. All right, so that's our quick overview of Agile and Agile testing. <clears throat> Let's look at our next topic. And we'll talk a little about that, exactly that criteria-based or criterion-based test design. And you'll see through these slides that I'm not always very good distinguishing between the singular criterion and the plural criteria. I apologize in advance. All right, so we've got this, um, you know, we've, we've got this older notion of testing that each of these levels of testing, unit testing, module, and system acceptance, they're all different and they all have different processes. Um, that's kind of an outdated view, although I still like this graph, not in the sense that I like doing things in the waterfall direction, right, right, doing things orderly, going down one side and up the other, but I like the graph because of the way that it gives you some hints about if I'm doing system testing, where should I be looking for notions about what systems, what the system correctness is? Oh, well, I should be looking to the architectural design. If I'm doing acceptance testing, where should I be looking for notions about correctness? I should be looking in requirements. So I like the way that it links those things, even though I don't propose that we march down one side and up the other, because we know that doesn't work well. So we can also have a newer view of testing, where we're really basing our testing on 
structures that we can extract from the thing that we're testing and criteria that we can apply to it. And that might be input space uh, analysis, we might be looking at graphs, we might be looking at logical expressions or syntax, those are the four topics we'll be talking about this semester. And so the process, the high level process of test design is very similar at each phase. It doesn't matter whether I'm doing unit testing or whether I'm doing acceptance testing. I'm still looking at figuring out what are the structures that I'm looking at testing and what criteria do I want to apply against them. The details might be very different. So if I want to create a model, uh, if I'm creating a model of my implementation for unit testing, that's going to be a very different process than creating a model of my requirements for um, acceptance testing. And automating the testing might be very different. I might be using JUnit for unit testing. I might be using Cucumber and Gherkin for system testing. Uh, but the overall process is very similar. And so that makes the tester's job fairly simple. Um, I don't really like the word simple because this can be quite complex, but it makes the job similar no matter what level of software we're testing. We want to define a model of the software and then find one or more criteria that will help us cover that model. Uh, and so that takes us to a couple of definitions. We've got a test criterion, and a test criterion is just a collection of rules and an associated process that lets us define test requirements. And test requirements are simply specific things that we have to do, right? Specific things that have to be satisfied or have to be covered, either of those words is appropriate, during testing. So where are we in our diagram? Well, we're, we're up here as we're talking about this, right? We're talking about creating a model based on some software artifact and then applying a criterion or multiple criteria to produce test requirements. So when we talk about test criteria, there are many, um, dozens, hundreds perhaps, uh, they tend to be based on four types of structures. Um, and you'll see this graph. Uh, this graph is, this graph represents the structure of the textbook. I forget right now whether the graph actually appears anywhere in the textbook, but these are basically the four main sections of, of test criteria in the textbook. And we'll be revisiting this graph basically every week going forward. Um, but we can model our software based on input domain analysis what are the possible inputs that can come into the system? Uh, we can do graph models based on the underlying artifact. We can examine logic expressions and we can look at the syntax. So for example, looking at structure, we can get from many different places. If we want to model our software or our system graphically, we can extract, extract graphs from a lot of different places. We might be able to extract it from use cases. We can certainly extract graphs out of source code. Um, the uh, control flow graph is probably one of the most common graphs that we'll be working with. If I've got a finite state machine, I can certainly extract a graph out of a finite state machine. In fact, this finite state machine basically just is a graph to begin with. Uh, if I'm looking at modeling logic expressions, I can pull logic expressions out of use cases. I can pull them out of decision points and source code. I can pull them out of finite state machine transitions, possibly other places as well. So let's define, let's, let's revisit our definition of coverage because we have talked about coverage previously. Um, so our definition of coverage is given some set of test requirements for a particular coverage criterion. A, a particular test set satisfies or covers that criterion if and only if for every test requirement that comes out of the criterion, there's at least one test in the test set that satisfies that test requirement. All right, so a, we use a criterion, we apply the criterion to produce a set of test requirements, and then coverage is basically just looking at, I've got test requirements, I've got a test set, how do they match up and how many of the test requirements are actually covered by the test set? Now we do have one little problem here, one tiny, teeny problem. Um, 
that of infeasible test requirements. We can often find test requirements that can't be satisfied. There is no possible test case that can meet the test requirement. So one example, a simple example of this might be dead code. And a simple dead code example might be, I can have some code that says, you know, if A is greater than B, then do this, else if A is less than or equal to B, then do that, else do something else. Well, I can never get to the something else because A is either greater than B or it's less than or equal to B. There are no other choices. So that whole else is dead code, can't be executed no matter what values of A and B I choose. Now that's a pretty simple example that's actually fairly easy to uncover. But in general, detecting infeasible, infeasible test requirements is formally undecidable for most test criteria. The outcome of that means that while in past weeks we talked about whether 100% was really a, a reasonable target, now we actually need to understand that 100% may not even be a possible target. It might e not even be possible to achieve no matter how hard we try. The takeaway being software can't be fully tested. And so we end up with, you know, things like this, right? On a deep level, I know I'm not up to this task. It's okay, none of us are. All right, so let's look at a simple example of coverage criteria. Um, so I've got jelly beans. I've got a bag of jelly beans. My jelly beans have six flavors in them. Um, these are weird flavors, but you know, lemon, pistachio, cantaloupe, pear, tangerine, and apricot. Um, all of those flavor flavors have colors, right? So we have yellow ones, the lemon and the apricot. We have a green pistachio. We have orange cantaloupe and tangerine, and we've got white pears. Um, so this sort of immediately suggests two possible coverage criteria. Um, we could have a coverage criterion, the flavor, right, the flavor criterion. And so the test requirements for the flavor criterion would be taste one jelly bean of each flavor. Well, okay, that seems fine. Although we do have a little bit of a controllability problem, right? We talked about controllability last time uh, or last week or maybe the week before. Controllability was our ability to properly pick test inputs that will execute a test. And so we have a controllability problem here because when I look at the jelly beans, I see yellow ones. Uh, are they lemon or are they apricot? I, I can't actually tell by looking. So it might be hard for me to satisfy the flavor criterion because it might be hard for me to make sure that I pick one of each flavor. Uh, we could have the color criterion, right? Taste one jelly bean of each color. That's relatively easy to do. I can look at the jelly beans, assuming that I have normal color vision and, and, and don't have any sort of reduced color vision. I can look at the jelly beans, I can see their color, I can easily pick jelly beans for each color. So let's look at a test case. I reach into my bag of jelly beans, I pull out a handful, I open up my hand and, um, you know, I, I nibble them a little bit to tell what they are. And I've got three lemons, I've got one pistachio, two cantaloupe, a pear, a tangerine, and four apricots. So does this handful, does test set T1, this handful of jelly beans, does this satisfy the flavor criterion? I know it's much better in person. Yes, it does. It does, sure. We had six kinds of jelly beans, six flavors of jelly beans. We got six flavors of jelly beans in my hand. So we have satisfied the color criterion. Uh, and we've also satisfied, I'm sorry, we've satisfied the flavor criterion. We've also satisfied the color criterion. Now I reach my hand in again, I pull out another handful of jelly beans, and now I've got one lemon, two pistachios, a pear, and three tangerines. Did I satisfy the flavor criterion? No. no, there's a few things I'm missing, right? I'm missing, uh, what am I missing? I'm missing cantaloupe white. and I'm missing something. White. Apricot. Apricot, yeah, I'm missing apricot, thank you. So no, that doesn't satisfy the flavor criteria. Does it satisfy the color criteria? Criterion. 
Yeah, sure it does. I've got the four colors. I've got a lemon, I've got a green, I've got a white, I've got an orange. So we've satisfied that. Great. So this, this lets us now revisit coverage level or coverage percent or coverage rate or lots of other terms, sometimes just called coverage. The coverage level is the ratio of the number of test requirements satisfied by the test set as compared to the total number of test requirements. So if I look at T2, my second handful of jelly beans for the lemon, a pistachio, a pear, and three tangerine, I satisfy four out of the six requirements for the flavor criterion. So I have 67% coverage, rounding slightly, 67% coverage for flavor. And, but I satisfy four out of the four test requirements for the color criterion. So I've actually achieved 100% color coverage. So seeing those two different coverages and the two different, um, seeing the two different coverage measurements of those two criteria leads me to the thought that, hmm, it might be useful to somehow be able to compare criteria. Um, if the results are different, if they require different tests, how do I know how different criteria compare? And I can compare them with what's called subsumption. Um, and definition first, some test criterion C1 subsumes some other test criterion C2, if and only if. Every set of test cases that satisfies C1 is also guaranteed to satisfy C2. No matter what set of test cases I pick, if they satisfy C1, they're guaranteed to satisfy C2. So for example, if I look at the flavor criterion in jelly beans, flavor subsumes color. Any test set that allows me to taste every flavor automatically I've tasted every color, but not the other way around because I can taste every color without tasting every flavor. So flavor subsumes color, but color does not subsume flavor. Cubes me one waffle then. Waffle, waffle, or. Um, now, if we look at this from a perspective of source code, um, Two criteria that are used pretty frequently for source code are statement coverage and branch coverage. We'll talk about both of those a little later in the semester, a few weeks out. Um, in statement coverage, we're trying to execute every line of code in our unit under test. And in branch coverage, we're trying to take every branch, right? And if we need to take the true branch and the false branch, a for loop, we need to go around the loop and out of the loop. Um, so if we execute every branch, then we have automatically executed every line of code. So branch coverage subsumes statement coverage. But if we execute every line of code, have we automatically executed every branch? And the answer is no. Um, and I'll leave it to you for the moment to think about, and that would actually make a great Piazza discussion, cases where we can execute every statement but not execute every branch. So branch subsumes statement coverage, but statement coverage does not subsume branch coverage. So why do we care? Well, we're using, We're using test criteria to try to maximize our bang for the buck, right? Trying to maximize the number of faults that we find for the amount of effort that we're putting in our tests. Um, we're, trying to we're trying to develop wide ranging comprehensive test sets. We'd like a minimum amount of overlap between tests. Duplicate tests don't really help. If I have tests that duplicate each other, I just have, that means I wasted my time writing tests. I'm gonna waste even more time maintaining them and they don't do anything more for me. Um, using criteria also gives me automatic traceability. If I know that I have a criteria that I'm, or a criterion that I'm trying to satisfy, then I have an answer to why this test, right? I can take that first handful of jelly beans and say, why did I pick this test? And my answer might be, because this test gives me all the flavors. 
And if I don't have this test, then I don't have all the flavors. That's why I want this test. Criterion also give us a stopping rule. Um, it allows us to understand how far along we are in our testing, when we've satisfied all of the test requirements, and we can say, good, that's enough, we're done. And they're fairly natural to automate, a um, little bit of an argumentative point, um, but relatively, there are relatively good tools for most uh, test criterion that will help us automate tests. So what does a good criterion look like? Um, so first, it should be easy to compute the test requirements, ideally automatically out of a tool, um, but it should be fairly straightforward to figure out, based on this test criterion, what are the test requirements that come out of it. We'd like it to be efficient to generate test values, fairly easy to come up and figure out what the test values are, and we'd like it to reveal as many faults as possible. That's why we're doing this in the first place, of course. And so, subsumption is actually a rough approximation of a criterion's ability to reveal faults. So, if I have branch coverage and branch coverage subsumes statement coverage, then it is probable that branch coverage will reveal more faults than statement coverage will reveal. Uh, and not just probable, but true. It's also more work, but it will reveal more faults. All right, that is it for coverage, or criterion, rather. One more short section, then we'll take a break. And our last short section here is on test doubles. <clears throat> So what's a test double and why do I want to use one? So let's go back to week two, where we had our monster that we were releasing, right? If our light's red and the valve is open, then release the monster. If the valve is open and the switch is on, then release the monster and the door comes up and out comes the monster. And guards get eaten and, you know, it's expensive and difficult to get the monster shoved back in the cage. So this is not really, you know, this is not a convenient test, right? Actually releasing the monster, not a very convenient test. We'd like to have a better, more convenient test that's less expensive to execute, that's faster to execute, right? Something that's, uh, something that's just easier to do. So perhaps we take the monster, we replace the monster with a puppy, when the, red, when the light is red and the valve is open, the door opens, the puppy comes out, we give her a cookie, we pat her on the head, say, good puppy, okay, go back in now so we can run the next test. Um, and what we're getting here is all of the functionality of the monster that we care about for the purpose of this test without all of the expensive, difficult stuff that goes along with using the real thing. So when might we want to use a test double? Um, first, let me go back and talk about the monster example again for a second. The key here is we're not testing the monster. We're really testing the release mechanism, right? We're testing the door. It's when the red, light is red and the valve is open, we expect the release mechanism to activate. The monster is just kind of like a, you know, it's, it's a side effect, it's a dependency. So that's the key here. We want to be using test doubles to represent dependencies that our software relies on. We're not, rep we're not using test doubles to represent our own software, the software we're testing. We're using it to represent pieces of software that we are using. So I might want to have a test double if some other piece of software that I'm using isn't implemented yet, right? We're working on a team. I'm working on my part. You know, my colleague, Bill, he's working on his part. My code calls Bill's code. Bill's code's not ready yet, but I'd like to test mine now. So I'd like to have some fake version of Bill's code to use for my testing. Or I might have some unrecoverable actions that occur. When we execute this test for real, using the real dependency, bad things happen, right? The door opens and the monster comes out. Or I send an email. I spend, send a spam email to 10,000 customers, you know, or I launch a missile. Um, these are bad things, unrecoverable actions. We don't want that to happen during testing. So I'd like to have some fake object in there that behaves the, real, the way the real thing does, but doesn't result in a bad action. 
Um, maybe I have a dependency with non-deterministic properties. Perhaps I'm writing a game and my game is based on a die roll. And so in order to figure out what the next, you know, backgammon move is, my code has to call the has to call the dice module and the dice module gives me back a random roll from one to 12. So it's actually really hard for me to write a repeatable test if I don't know what the dice roll is going to be. I mean, how, how can I know what my behavior should be? So I want, might wanna replace that dice roll with a repeatable one, right? I'll, I'll replace it with fake dice that will roll a three and then a seven and then a 12 and then a five and we'll do the same thing every time and now I can write tests based on that. And I also wanna be aware that there might be some irrelevant changes to the dependency, to the thing that I'm calling, some irrelevant changes that if they change, if its internal behavior changes, it might break my test, even though all my code is still working. And so the example that I'll use here is, imagine I'm writing a piece of code that takes two numbers, two integers, and finds the common prime factors of those two integers. I'm gonna assume that you understand, that you know what common prime factors are, what prime factors are. Now, I'm going to call a dependency that actually does the factoring. So I'm going to take my two numbers and I'm going to call the call it some other piece of code. And that piece of code will give me back the prime factors for each number. And then I'm just going to compare those two lists and pick out the ones that are common. Now, if something happened to that prime factor dependency, right, to that other code that's computing prime factors, that changed the way it worked and it started giving me back different prime factors, all my tests would break, even though my code to find common ones still works perfectly. So I might wanna protect myself from future possible changes down there by providing a fake one. So we have a couple of different types of test doubles. Um, there are actually a lot of names out there. I've seen some uh, some websites and blog posts that identify as many as nine. Um, I'm just going to stick with three. My first one is a test stub, and a test stub is some custom developed some custom developed piece of code that I will write myself as part of my testing that will simulate this other thing, this this other dependency, and then I can have a mock. And a mock is similar in that it's a piece of code that's going to substitute for a dependency, but a mock is going to be a tool provided thing. So I don't actually have to write it. I'm going to get it out of a mocking tool. Um, and then my last thing would be this last line, a simulator. And when I think about a simulator, I'm thinking about something much more complex, um, something that has some deep functional capabilities. Like, for example, um, if I had let's say I was testing a radio and my radio needs, you know, it needs a, an audio input um, or it needs a, a signal input, really. Um, a signal input maybe isn't going to come from a stub or a mock. I might, I might have to do a much more complicated simulator that will feed me a signal stream in order for me to turn to, you know, to demodulate that and turn that into audio and test the audio. Um, so that would be a simulator, which is kind of a more complicated thing than either stubs or mocks. All right, so let's take a look at this and let's think about what do I mean here and how will I create a test double? And more importantly, how will I use one once I've created it? So imagine here, I've got a JUnit test and it's testing some piece of code that I'm writing. This is the thing I wanna test. And my code calls some dependent piece of code. It calls some code that's a detonator. And in the real life, that detonator is going to cause a bomb to explode. Um, in my unit testing, I don't really want to have a real detonator there and I don't really want to have a real bomb. It makes a mess in the lab. It's expensive, it's noisy. There's a lot of sweeping of broken things out of the lab every time we do it. I'd like a much simpler, cleaner test. So what I'd like is for my code that I'm testing, my UUT, unit under test, I'd like it to call a fake detonator, right? A detonator test double. And maybe the detonator test double just prints out boom instead of actually blowing something up. Now I can run unit tests all day long, right? Without the nasty overhead of having bombs going off in the lab. 
So how do I get my unit under test, the software that I'm trying to test, how do I get it to use the detonator test double instead of using the real detonator? And that can actually be quite a challenge. Um, there are a number of ways I could do it. First of all, maybe I just have a different version of my unit under test, right? I've got a copy of it and the copy version calls the detonator double. And I do all my testing with the copy version. And then at the last minute, we substitute in the real one and ship the product. Um, yeah, that's a really bad solution because then I'm actually doing all of my testing on some other piece of code, not the piece of code I'm gonna deliver. Also, uh, now I've got two versions. I've got a real version and a test version. It's very easy for those to get out of sync. I make changes in one. I don't make the corresponding changes in the other. But that's a bad approach. It's just gonna work poorly. So instead, let's look for what Michael Feathers calls seams. So what's a seam? A seam is just, just a point in my software where I can wedge in there and change the behavior somehow. And a few seams, probably the most common ones, um, where can I change the behavior? Well, I can change the behavior with the compiler, kind of obviously. Um, I can change the behavior by manipulating the class path or controlling what the linker does if I'm using C++ or some other linked language. I can control the behavior by using inheritance. And last of all, I can control the behavior by using the Java virtual machine or more broadly, any underlying interpreter if I'm running an interpreted language like Java or Python or a handful of others. So let's look at each of these briefly. So if I wanna use a compiler seam, I can add some code into my program that at compile time or at runtime will enable a test mode. So basically, I'll just have some code in there that says, you know, if I'm in test mode, then use the fake version, else use the real version. Um, one common way of implementing this is to have a test mode constructor, right? I have got a regular constructor that I call most of the time in the real code. And then I've got a test mode constructor. And when we're doing unit testing, I create this thing using the test constructor, and that configures it into test mode so that I can do my unit testing. So this has some real advantages. It's easy to understand. It's fast to implement. People will tend to look at this and go, oh, I see what you were doing there. Um, but it also has a significant disadvantage. And the disadvantage is we're not actually testing the exact same code as we're going to be using in the delivered system, right? I'm testing it with the test mode constructor and all of the test mode code. And hopefully that's only a little different than the real code, but it's still not quite the real deliverable code that I want in my final system. So maybe I can use the class path or use the linker. Um, and so I can take those dependencies that I'd be calling that would get connected through my class path or through my, uh, you know, through my linking objects, you know, linking in my object files. And I'm gonna change my class path or I'm gonna change my link setup. And instead of linking with the real things, I'm going to link with the test doubles. So this has a really good advantage. And the real good advantage is there's no change to the unit under test. That piece of code that I'm testing, it's exactly, I'm testing exactly what I'm gonna deliver. It's also fairly easy to implement. The disadvantage here is that now I've got my, you know, my library of real things and my other library of test things and maintaining those to make sure they stay in sync, that can be a little time consuming. And there's also the risk, probably a small risk, but a risk that I might end up accidentally linking in one of the test doubles when I build my program to distribute it. So what about inheritance? How can I use inheritance for, how can I use an inheritance seam to get test double behavior. Well, I might define, I might take the dependency, whatever class that is, and I might derive a new class from it. I'll derive a, a child class from it, and I'll override the original implementation with my test functionality implementation. So for example, if there was some bomb detonator interface out there that actually, you know, made the bomb explode, I could inherit from that and I could override the detonate method. And instead of doing whatever it needs to do 
to make the bomb explode, I could just change the detonate method to print boom. So we've got a real advantage here. Again, no change to the unit under test. We're testing exactly what we're going to deliver. That's great. There is a disadvantage here, and the disadvantage is I've kind of only kicked the can down the road a little bit, right? Now I've got this inherited class, right, this derived class, and it does exactly what I want, but how do I make my unit under test use the derived class instead of using the real class? Um, I might have to, you know, if I'm using static, um, static factory, static object factories, I might have to change the object factory. I might have to switch to using a technique called dependency injection. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Um, but there's, you know, there's some work that I have to do to make this happen. Speaking of dependency injection, what is dependency injection? Usually when you're writing code and you're writing an object and your object needs some other object, you'll just declare it there inside your code, right? You'll have, um, you'll have a private version of it. It might be a member, it uh, might be a member variable. Um, you'll create the dependencies that you need. That's nice from a perspective of information hiding and encapsulation, right? Nobody else needs to know about what you need. Anything you need is hidden inside your code. That's a nice architecture. The problem is it's hard to change that, right? It's hard to replace one of those things that you need with a fake version of what you need. So dependency injection is an opportunity to do that, a way to do that. So in dependency injection, we're gonna pass in the dependency to your code and we're gonna pass it in with the constructor or maybe there's a setter method. And we're either gonna pass in the real thing or we're gonna pass in the fake test double. So this is really flexible. It allows lots of different flavors of test doubles. As long as they all inherit from the same base class or from the same interface, you can have lots of different flavors of them. That's kind of nice. The big disadvantage is it really breaks encapsulation because now, whoever is calling my code and creating my object needs to know about the things I'm going to use. And that's kind of an unfortunate, um, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate compromise. Our last opportunity that we talked about is our Java virtual machine seam. And I'll, I'll stick with Java here, although the same thing happens in Python and probably other, elsewhere in other interpreted languages. So in Java, I can define a mock object using a mocking tool that we'll talk a little bit about. And that mocking tool will automatically reach into the Java virtual machine and tell the Java virtual machine, hey, anytime you see a call to this class, intercept it and send it to this fake object instead. That's extremely powerful. So, the biggest advantage is there's no change to the unit under test or to anything else. The entire system remains the same. It's completely transparent. I don't have to change a single piece of code anywhere. And it's easy to do, especially if I'm using the right mocking tool. Um, there are a lot out there. I've kind of gone lately with the uh, last couple of years, I've been using JMocket more than others. Um, it's entirely possible that JMocket is old fashioned at this point, but it's been adequate for me and having learned it, I haven't been that enthused about moving. Um, there are a couple of disadvantages. The big disadvantage is this only works with interpreted languages. You can't use this approach with, for example, C or C++, because there is no underlying virtual machine to intercept that call and send it anywhere else. Um, the other smaller disadvantage is perhaps in the real system, there are many, many, many instances of that dependency out there. Well, all of those instances are going to be intercepted and sent to a single static mock object in place of all of those real ones. Um, that's a little bit limiting, but from a perspective of unit testing, usually doesn't bother us too badly. So it's actually, this is actually a really, really practical thing to do in Java and in Python. All right, so let's take that example of code that I talked about a little while ago, finding the common prime factors of code, and let's look at how we would mock that with a mocking tool and a mock object using the JVM to capture things. So here's my unit test class. 
So the first thing my unit test class is, does is it declares a mock object. And basically it's saying this thing called prime factors mock, this is going to be a mock object and it's going to mock the class named prime factors. So anytime you see any call to an, to an object of class prime factors, send it here instead. And then we're going to declare some data for the mock object to return. Now here, the thing that I'm mocking is a call to get the prime factors of a number. And so we're going to return the prime factors of a list. And so here I'm just setting up, I'm just setting up a list of prime factors of four and a list of prime factors of six. It's just some data for some particular test cases. Now this is where the magic happens. Here is where I tell the mock object what I expect to happen and what it should do when those things happen. And so specifically, I'm telling the mock object, you should expect to be called with the get prime factors function or method and passed a four. And when that happens, return this list that's factors of four. And then you should expect to be called with the get prime factors method and expect to be passed a six. And when that happens, return this list of data that happens to be the factors of six. So really, I've taken all the implementation out. I don't care how the prime factoring occurs. I don't care if it's Civ of Aristophanes. I don't care if it's whatever other factoring method you need to use. We cut the whole implementation out. All we're saying is, these are the calls that are going to happen. And when they happen, respond with these values. So I didn't actually have to write any code at all. I'm just defining the expected inputs and the expected outputs for this mock object. And then I have what is a pretty typical JUnit test. <clears throat> I'll call get prime, I'll call get common prime factors. I'll pass it a four, I'll pass it a six. Inside my get com, common prime factors class, it will call the mock object, right? And it will call get prime factors for four and get prime factors for six. And then it'll look at those lists and figure out what the right answers are. And then I will assert that the result is one number and that number is two, because two is the common prime factor of four and six. All right, I know that was kind of a lot to get your head around, um, but this is a really, really neat capability uh, and you'll have an experience, you'll have an opportunity to experience, experiment with this a little bit in the next assignment. All right, so when do I want what? I talked about stubs, I talked about mocks, I talked about simulators. Basically, if I've got a really, really, really simple substitution, um, right, always return true or always, you know, return zero or return null, then I can just use a stub. I just write a simple little piece of code and we'll call that, and that's fine. If I have a little bit more of a complex scenario and I want to verify that the calls are what I expect them to be and I want it to return different values, then I'll do what I just showed on the previous slide. I'll use a mock object because it's really good at doing that. And if I've got some highly complex scenario, like I need a continuous real-time data stream, I have some kind of closed loop control and I need to keep on getting data in and manage what that data is, um, then probably a more complicated custom-built simulator is the thing that I'm going to want for that job. All right, I promised it all along. I probably should have put this slide first instead of last because I mentioned it so many times. Great book working effectively with legacy code. Like I said, it's about 15 years old. It's as useful today as the day it was written. Um, if you're working with large bodies of code that you're trying to figure out how to test, um, it would definitely be worth your time uh, to take a look at this book. It's really, uh, it's, it's a good one and it's a really, it's an easy book to read and a pretty easy book to understand. Highly recommend it. All right, that takes us to the end of our lecture. Um, we're uh, 612. Let's come back at, uh, let's come back at 620. We'll make it 622. We'll do 10 minutes, 10 minute break. We're back at 622 and we'll go into the, uh, into our exercises for today. So see you in 10 minutes. <laughs>